Hey, so I am now going to walk you through the proposal. You can see here um, you've got the actual proposal itself that has the form and all the questions that you can fill out and then upload. Uh, and now you've got an example, and that's what this one is. So this is exactly what your paper needs to look like. You can delete this first part. If I don't say delete it, you don't have to, so you always read the you know, directions carefully so you'll know when I ask you to delete it. But you do have to put your MLA heading right here. You don't have a title for this, so just go right to answer the first question. So the first question is, again, putting in that very specific research question that you revised and come to. You can see here is the question that I came to uh, after going through all the five W's and things like that that I showed you in the video. Um, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to describe your audience and why you chose them. So here is a, a easy way for you to say it. My target audience is community college English faculty who are involved in curriculum decisions for transitional English programs, right? So you can see the first part is community college English faculty. That's who I've chosen. And I've chosen them because they are involved in those curriculum decisions, right? Uh, for transitional English. Transitional English is the, the latest buzzword that we use for zero level courses. So now describe my purpose in writing about this topic and very specifically, what do I want to change? So when I've been looking at research proposals for other classes, I notice that I get the first part of this, but I oftentimes don't get the last part. And so if you want full credit for this question, you need to tell me, you know, why do you want to write about it? And then what do you actually want to change? Because that's why we do an argument paper, right? We're trying to convince readers to do something, right? So for this one, uh, by arguing that eliminating prerequisite courses will increase retention rates, I am hoping to reform the current system that causes students to wait an entire semester before enrolling in a credit course for English. This can lower motivation, which often results in students failing the class because they have stopped attending or submitting work, right? Now, you know, this is my field. It's easier for me to really write a very comprehensive uh, thing because I'm an expert in this area. So remember, this is a proposal. That just means that this is what you think you're going to be doing. We aren't writing the paper, right? Uh, but you have to plan like you are. But if we were finishing this paper, or if you were going to be in my comp too when we were doing this very same essay, um, then, you know, you're just, this is, kind of what you think you're going to be doing right now. But as you do research and as you write your paper, right, writing is messy, you may come up with a different purpose or you might decide that you want to focus on a, a slightly different area, right, within the same discipline, right? Um, you know, if I've already given my proposal and it's been approved, I can't totally change everything, but I might change uh, community college to just regular college. I might change that I'm not going to talk about maybe prerequisite at all. Maybe I want to talk about freshman comp, right? It's still within the same area that I've been doing research in, but maybe I want to kind of change or refocus a bit, right? So again, you don't have to have all the answers, just kind of what do you think you want to do at this point? So the next thing is your three-point thesis, right? And so obviously, if I might just be able to take my research question and just flip it around and write a thesis, and then I just have to add my three points. That's what's missing here in my research question. I don't have the three points of support that I will use, right? So I would have to add that, but I could just say community college English faculty should support replacing prerequisite freshman writing classes with co-requisite courses because, and then one, two, and three. Right. I didn't quite do that, but it's pretty close, right? English faculty should support co-requisite only remediation because it saves money, builds confidence, and encourages autonomy. So notice, instead of saying replacing prerequisite with co-requisite, I just basically took that and said co-requisite only remediation. So that was another way I could really refine and not have such a wordy uh, thesis. Notice I don't say community college English faculty. Um, that is probably going to be okay, right? Um, what I would do before I got to the thesis in the introduction is I would obviously narrowing it, narrow it to community college so that by the time I get here, when I say English faculty, my reader knows that I'm only talking about community college people. Um, but I could easily say community college here. The, the reason I would maybe not do that is if I've used community college in the sentence right before my thesis. 
right? Uh, so what I would say for you is go ahead and use community college or, you know, whatever would be equivalent to that in your thesis, knowing that you might, you know, revise it a bit by the time it actually gets to the paper process, which remember, we're not doing in this class. Um, so how did I come up with saves money, builds confidence and encourages autonomy? Well, remember, you're supposed to have been researching uh, from the first point that you went and looked at those topics right, going out and adding to what you know about it. And so what I found was that when I went out and researched, I probably read about 10 or 15 articles. I didn't read the whole thing. I skimmed them, right? I found that these were three really common uh, points of support that the most recent research was finding, right? So now I'm going to take those three and I'm going to turn them into topic sentences. And remember, these all have to be complete sentences. Nowhere in the first six questions here, should you ever write a fragment? Everything should be a complete thought. So my first one, remember, which is saves money, becomes in an academic environment of decreased budgets, making a move to co-requisite remediation has significant saving benefits for students and colleges, right? So notice I, I could have just said, the first reason is that it saves money, right? There, that's okay, but that's kind of a C-level kind of uh, writing, right? Just basically exactly telling you what I said in the, the thesis, except narrowing it on the one, right? This is kind of A-level writing, right? I have transformed that point in my thesis to something that's much more rich, right? The second point is build confidence. So here I'm gonna get a chance to be a little bit more specific. Eliminating prerequisite courses increases student empowerment. So notice I just didn't say adding co-requisite, I've said that up here, so a different way to say that would be eliminating prerequisite, right? So again, this is how you can say the same thing, but you change it up so you're not just constantly using the same stuff. That's when you get that REP uh, from me on your writing, right? And then the last one is about um, encourages autonomy. So by saving students money and building their confidence, colleges help them attain academic independence. Right. And so I have to make sure that student empowerment and independence are separate enough that I'm not doing too much overlap. Right. Uh, and, you know, I know that I can make them two really distinct uh, things. Right. Because independence is the end result of confidence and, and that kind of stuff. Right. OK. So now your last question that you have to answer is the counterclaim. And so that's basically, as you do your research, you should pay attention to any paper or position that is identified that is counter to what you're hoping to prove, right? If it is an argumentative paper, then you will find people out there that have different opinions. That's why it's argument. And what I found when I was doing my research for this, I found two kind of important counterclaims. Now, if you take me for comp two and you do this assignment, you'll see in the instructions, they'll be a little bit different than what you got for this assignment, because this is comp one, but the comp two version of this, you will have to include one or two counterclaims. So I give students the, the leeway to just do one, or they can do two. So here I have, co-requisite courses do not increase persistence, the likelihood students will complete a degree or transfer to a four-year college and graduate, and they only work for, so co-requisite courses only work for students near the cut score and not those with more serious remediation needs. So these are both arguments about the use of co-requisite only, right? Um, and when I was looking at this, I had to consider, I mean, are these right? Because if these are right, then I have to consider whether I can actually argue that we should only offer co-requisite. But what happened when I was doing my research, I really found that there are some studies that actually show, no, they do increase persistence. A fairly recent study um, about the entire Tennessee, I believe, community college system uh, showed that it did increase persistence. So I know I have research from credible sources that actually will counter that, right? That's called a counterclaim. And then again, it only works for students near the cut score and not those with more serious remediation needs. Let me tell you, when I was reading that, uh, those articles that were talking about that, I was like, like, well, dang it, I really can't argue this. But I just kept going and kept going, and I started finding other articles by experts as well that said, no, that's not necessarily true. 
that actually it does help people with more serious remediation needs. So again, I didn't just stop when I had something that caused me a stumbling block, right? I, I then said, okay, can I then disprove this? Or can I put it in such a context that there may be truth to these and there is truth to these, but I can show how the problems that these groups are finding are either not significant enough to, to keep the old way of doing things, or I might be able to identify particular things that were happening with those students or with that study that really don't make those things relevant to what I'm arguing, right? So again, I, I can find these things, and then part of that research is being able to say, can I rebut them? Can I refute them uh, enough that my argument still stands, okay? And then the last thing you're going to do is you're going to find your three uh, credible sources. So you're using that crap test, right? Currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. Uh, you're going to be looking at these and seeing how well they meet those standards. Uh, and if you're doing something like going to EBSCO and you are using academic journals, they pretty much already are going to tick off all of those boxes. The only real things you have to worry about those is, is the information current still, right? Is it out of date? Um, or is it, and is it relevant, right? Is that study going to be really something I can apply here, right? For example, in that video that you were, that you should have watched about evaluating sources, the, the, the speaker gives the example of someone needing to do research, I believe, on adult depression uh, in women. And she found a study about adolescent female depression. And she said, well, you know, that's not really relevant because I'm not looking at adolescents. I'm looking at adults, right? So again, you have to make sure that the study actually meets those two because it will probably be okay in terms of the authority and the accuracy and usually even the purpose because a journal that's peer-reviewed is going to make sure that those things are okay. But again, if it's, you know, from 20, you know, 2002, that might be too old for what you're talking about, right? It, the age might not matter. So again, it just depends on what your topic is. So again, you're saying that I am alphabetizing them. I'm following that MLA guidelines uh, and, you know, providing my sources. Uh, and you'll see, you know, this one is just a website I mean, this one's a website. I believe I got this one from, no, I, all of these, I got all of these on uh, actual um, archives for these credible sources through Google. So I didn't even have to go to EBSCO at this point. Uh, all of these are credible research uh, organizations and they just made their content available to anybody coming to their website. So again, I didn't have to worry about you know, going to EBSCO, I found those credible academic sources uh, quite handily through Google. You might not find those as easily, right? And again, if you're having trouble finding sources, that's when you need to reach out to me. You know, if you were in my face-to-face -face class, you know, we kind of go over this in class. I kind of force the students to bring their sources and to really deal with that. By taking an online course, you're having to really, you know, kind of hold up your part of the bargain much more than a face-to-face -face student is because I don't know, I'm giving you all this information, I'm giving you handouts and videos that help you do that. You know, if you don't apply them, then you're not getting that help. And if you apply them and you're struggling, but you don't ask me for help, you're not getting that help. So again, you know, don't be shy if you really can't find anything, but you think you've got a viable topic just let me know and I bet I can find, if it is a good topic, if it will work, I probably can find you quite a few topics and links to places that will show you, you know, the kind of sources that you have. And I'd be happy to do that. I love researching. So uh, again, you know, reach out if you need help. Uh, good luck and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.